Behind the Line, episode 48. I'm your host, KC. You can follow me on Twitter at KC underscore BTL84. Make sure to hit the like and subscribe button on YouTube. Leave a five-star rating on iTunes. I appreciate your support. Jerry Jones and the Dallas Cowboys have a serious problem on their hands. And his name is Dak Prescott. Dak is usually a mild-mannered guy. Rarely does he stir the pot come out in the media and and say negative things about anyone or the organization. He was silent regarding his future and contract talks the entire 2019 season. Didn't say a word about it. But lately, the usually mild-mannered Prescott has taken on a bit of a new demeanor. He's beginning to show signs of frustration that the Cowboys haven't made a commitment to him long term haven't offered him the big money contract that he feels like he deserves. And now he's saying he won't be working out near Dallas this offseason. Which is a big problem considering that the Cowboys just hired Mike McCarthy. And they're going to need this offseason for Dak and the offense to learn his system. Jerry Jones has until March 10th to work something out with Dak Prescott, which gives him about six weeks. But the timing isn't necessarily the problem. The first problem is, for starters, is Dak Prescott worth committing long-term? One of the advantages in giving him a long-term contract instead of using the franchise tag is they can spread that money out over several years. Just like, The Saints have done the past several seasons with Drew Brees. If they franchise tagged him, the $28 or $30 million that he would get in 2020 would go directly against their salary cap. But back to my original question. Is Dak Prescott a guy that is worth paying $35 to $40 million a year? The answer is no. I keep hearing people brag about Dak finishing second last season in passing yards. That is highly misleading. First of all, guess who finished first last season in passing yards? Jameis Winston in Tampa. He and Dak had two things in common. Both their statistics were inflated because both were playing from behind most games in the fourth quarter. And both were sitting at home in January watching the playoffs from their couch. Secondly, we've seen what happens when teams commit major money to quarterbacks. Look what happened in Seattle after Russell Wilson got his big contract. Same in Green Bay with Aaron Rodgers. The Rams were in the Super Bowl in 2018, gave Jared Goff that massive contract, didn't even make the fucking playoffs last year. There hasn't been a team pay their quarterback north of $30 million and make it to the Super Bowl. Look at the two quarterbacks in this year's Super Bowl. Jimmy G made $17 million. Patrick Mahomes is still on his rookie deal, made $645,000. There's a reason that the Kansas City Chiefs are hesitant right now in giving Patrick Mahomes his extension. It's not because they don't want him around the rest of his career. They know that once they give him that big money, their Super Bowl chances evaporate. Think about this from a Jerry Jones perspective. He badly wants to win a Super Bowl before he loses all his marbles or he passes away. At his age, he knows that time is running out. He knows If he gives Dak Prescott $35, $40 million, the chances of the Dallas Cowboys winning a Super Bowl in his lifetime are slim to none. Not to mention the fact that the Cowboys aren't fucking winning with Dak Prescott on his rookie deal making peanuts compared to the other quarterbacks that are making big money. And he's surrounded with weapons. They just finished 8-8 in the worst division in the NFL. The banged-up Eagles with Carson Wentz throwing to guys who should be playing in the XFL won the division from a Dallas team that was damn near fully healthy. 
Philly will be better next year. The Giants and Daniel Jones will be better next year. What the fuck do you think is going to happen in Dallas when Dak is eating up 15, 20% of the salary cap? And there's no money left for guys like Amari Cooper or other guys that you want to bring in. Paying Patrick Mahomes is one thing. It's unavoidable. He's a winner. He's won you a Super Bowl. Dak Prescott hasn't won a fucking thing in his NFL career. However, the problem is Dak has all the leverage. He's got the Cowboys bent over a barrel. He's the only experienced quarterback on this roster. They've got a new coaching staff. So they need Dak present to learn this offense and lead offseason workouts. It's so difficult to find a quarterback in the NFL. Hardest position in sports to fill. It makes it even more difficult when the guy that you have, Dak in this instance, is good, but he's not great. He gives you false hope. Looks like a pro bowler against the bad teams. Every once in a while, he will have a good game against a team like the Rams. But his ceiling isn't that high. He's a mid-tier quarterback in this league, but demanding top-tier money. If guys like Russell Wilson and Aaron Rodgers are struggling to make it back to the Super Bowl after taking their massive contracts, what the fuck do you think is going to happen in Dallas if they give Dak $40 million? Now, sure, the Cowboys could look in free agency, the draft, but who's available? Tom Brady likely isn't interested. Who's left? Cam Newton? Maybe Teddy Bridgewater? He would be a step up from Dak, but I'm not sure if Teddy Bridgewater would be interested in the Dallas job. Seems like he's leaning towards Miami if he leaves New Orleans. Jerry Jones is in a lose-lose. If he franchise tags Dak, he pisses him off and commits 28 to 30 million to next season's cap. If he gives him the extension that he wants, then he kisses his Super Bowl chances in his lifetime goodbye. All right, moving on. Tom Brady is officially becoming the biggest troll on social media. He's new to Twitter, he's new to Instagram. I think he's only had his accounts for a couple of months, few months, but He has become a professional troll. The picture I talked about last week on the podcast of him walking out of Gillette Stadium, seemingly for the last time, at least symbolically it seemed that way, ended up being for a fucking commercial. He fooled everyone, myself especially. That being said, I still feel like his days in New England are over. Robert Kraft, the owner of the Patriots, has offered Tom Brady $30 million to come back next season. I think it's too little too late. Money is not going to convince Tom Brady to come back. He's made hundreds of millions of dollars already. His fine-ass wife makes more than he does. The Patriots have taken advantage of him. He feels disrespected. And I don't think anything they can do at this point will convince him to come back to New England. The problem isn't with Robert Kraft. The problem is Bill Belichick doesn't want Tom Brady back. We've talked about it on the podcast. Also, I don't think Tom Brady wants to be back in New England. I think he's sick of it. I also think both of them want to prove they can win the Super Bowl without each other. I don't care what all these so-called experts say. Most of these talking heads on ESPN, Fox Sports are trying to convince you that Tom Brady is returning to New England. I'm telling you, it's not going to happen. The networks, of course, won him back with the Patriots. Dynasties are great for ratings. Look what happened to the NBA this year once the Golden State Warriors fell apart. Ratings took a nosedive. People either love a dynasty or love to hate them. Either way, they're going to watch. I talked several times about where Tom Brady could end up playing next season. Rumors are it could be the Chargers, the Raiders. I've said I think he would fit well with the Colts. He could end his career where his biggest rival, Peyton Manning, started his. It'd be an interesting story. But I got to thinking, what if Tom Brady went to San Francisco? 
There are rumors going around that he could return home to the Bay Area, sign with the 49ers. they got a ready-made defense, great offensive line, great running game, one of the best tight ends in the league. We saw how different Tom Brady and the Patriots offense looked last season without Gronk. George Kittle could be his new Gronk. 49ers have a great young head coach in Kyle Shanahan, even though he just fucked up his chance to win a Super Bowl. The question is, if Tom Brady did sign with the 49ers, what would John Lynch do with Jimmy Garoppolo? You could sit him for a year behind Tom Brady, but would Jimmy G go for that? Doubtful. Once you're a starting quarterback in this league, especially coming off of a Super Bowl season, It's tough to give up your starting job. Look at Drew Brees last season. Rushed back from his injury, I believe partly because the Saints were doing so well without him. Didn't want to lose his position to Teddy Bridgewater, even though we all knew that was never going to happen. So what does San Francisco do with Jimmy G if Tom Brady comes to Silicon Valley? You trade him to New England. Bill Belichick drafted him. I believe a lot of the tension between Belichick and Brady stems from New England having to trade Jimmy G a couple of years ago. Belichick would now have his quarterback of the future and it'd be a race between he and Tom Brady to see who could win their first Super Bowl without the other. They'd have to work out the salary cap details and of course it'd depend on what the Niners would want in return for Jimmy G. But Robert Kraft's already offering Tom Brady $30 million for the upcoming season. Jimmy Garoppolo is scheduled to make a shade under $24 million in 2020. Now that being said, I think it would be a monumental mistake for the Niners to do this. Tom Brady would be a short-term solution to a problem that really doesn't exist. People keep forgetting that Jimmy G is coming off ACL surgery. I think he will be a lot better next year. Not to mention the fact that He and the Niners outplayed Kansas City three quarters of that Super Bowl. And Kyle Shanahan is more to blame for the loss than Jimmy G. All right, moving on. Let's get to the NBA. I'm starting to think that Daryl Morey and the Houston Rockets have lost their fucking mind. Coming into this season, this roster was undersized. Most of the players on this roster are 6'6 and under. The one big they had, the one guy they could depend on to defend the paint, grab rebounds, do the dirty work, was Clint Capella. Capella's currently sidelined with an injury that Mike D'Antoni has hinted could keep him out for a while, but he's definitely going to be ready come playoff time. In his absence, the Rockets have been getting killed on the glass. That game against New Orleans Sunday showed just how much They need Clint Capella on the court. Derek Favors and Zion Williamson were dominating inside. The Pelicans out-rebounded Houston by 20 fucking rebounds. If it weren't for the 20-plus Pelican turnovers, they would have won that game by double digits. Houston was out-rebounded against Dallas and Charlotte. Now, the Rockets have managed to win all three of those games, but that's not going to happen in the postseason. You can't afford to give up second-chance opportunities like that in the playoffs where every possession counts and win. So, what's Daryl Morey's master plan to address their size issue? You trade away Clint Capella, a double-double machine for Jordan Bell and Robert Covington. What the fuck? Some will try and justify this trade by saying Clint Capella no longer fits this Rockets team. Well, whose fault is that? Mike D'Antoni's. They quit setting on-ball screens, quit running the pick and roll. They started relying mainly on the three ball, which isn't the way to win long-term in the NBA. Check out these numbers. Capella's first real season as a starter was 2016-2017. The Rockets ranked 7th in the league in pick and roll. Finished the season in the Western Conference semis. 2017-2018, ranked 9th. Finished in the Western Conference Finals in a great series against Golden State that they would have won had Chris Paul not been injured late in Game 5. 2018-2019, they dropped all the way to 23rd. 
couldn't beat the Warriors without Kevin Durant and the Western Semis. And now this season, they rank 30th. And they're 5th in the Western Conference. Do you notice a correlation here? This team was better when they were utilizing Clint Capella correctly. Not only that, they desperately need his defense. The Rockets already rank near the bottom of the league defensively with Capella in the lineup. James Harden doesn't play defense. Russell Westbrook is a downgrade defensively compared to Chris Paul. They should have never let Trevor Ariza go either. This small ball lineup is not going to work. This seems like a desperation move by Daryl Morey, who is feeling the heat from Rockets' ownership. The team is regressing. He cost the NBA $150, $200 million with his comments about the Chinese government. He's grasping at straws, trying to make this Rockets team a legitimate threat in the West. Trading away their anchor in the paint isn't the way to do it. Now, long term, I think this will actually work out for Clint Capella. Obviously, Houston didn't feel he was worth his contract anymore. Didn't fit their system that is not working. Capella was traded to the Hawks, who aren't going anywhere this season. But their future is as bright as it's been in years. Trey Young is an emerging superstar, and Atlanta runs an offensive system that fits Capella perfectly. They're fourth in the league running the pick and roll. Trey Young's a great passer. He should fit well with John Collins, who also plays center, but is more of a three-point shooter. They shouldn't get in each other's way in the pain, and actually, Capella's presence will help Collins get more open three-point shots. I just don't understand this move from the Houston Rockets' perspective. This team is on its last legs. This is likely Mike D'Antoni's last season. Daryl Morey could be on his way out as well. Could be a complete reconstruction going into next season in terms of coaching and management. The decisions that Daryl Morey has made the past couple of years have closed this championship window. Russell Westbrook and his contract are untradeable. It's the equivalent of John Wall and his contract, or Chris Paul and the contract that Daryl Morey gave him. At least Chris Paul was productive. This team was most effective when they had a stretch wing player like Trevor Ariza and Capella anchoring the paint. They lose that series to Golden State two years ago when Chris Paul was injured with the Rockets up 3-2. And then they blow everything up. Very similar to what the Orlando Magic did 10 years ago after losing the finals to the Lakers. They give Chris Paul that massive contract when he's well past his prime years, which made it impossible to keep Trevor Ariza. And now they trade Clint Capella. It just doesn't make sense to me. How the fuck... Are you going to win in the playoffs with a small ball lineup? No one on the floor over 6'6". Who's going to defend guys like Anthony Davis, Jokic in Denver? Houston will get dominated inside. If James Harden has another shooting drought like he did in January, this team could get swept in the first round. Another team that made some puzzling decisions or non-decisions at the trade deadline was the Los Angeles Lakers. Now, it's not often that I feel sorry for LeBron James, but after Thursday's deadline, I feel bad for the guy. He's committed himself to being all in for the Lakers this season. And Rob Palenka and Lakers management have officially shit the bed. This is the difference between having Jerry West and having a guy like Rob Palenka. All week this week, It's been unclear whether or not the Lakers were willing to part with Kyle Kuzma in exchange for Marcus Morris. Now, I'm not sure why this was such a difficult decision for Rob Palenka. Seemed like a no-brainer to me. Jerry West made the deal. And if the Clippers weren't the front runners in the Western Conference before, they definitely are now. They've already beaten LeBron and the Lakers twice. And now they add an efficient three-point shooter, making them even more difficult for the Lakers to defend. This is plain incompetence by Rob Palenka. Kyle Kuzma's a decent player, has the potential to be good. But the Lakers are in win-now mode. LeBron James, at this point in his career, is in win-now mode. 
You don't sign LeBron James to contend for titles in two years. You sign him to win today. You traded your future for Anthony Davis to win now. And you had the opportunity to trade the last piece of that future, Kyle Kuzma, to the Knicks for Marcus Morris. And you not only declined, you let the other team in the building go out and fucking get him. The Lakers needed to make a move at the deadline, and Marcus Morris would have been ideal. LeBron needs someone with playoff experience, something that Kyle Kuzma does not have. Marcus Morris has been there before, played in the Eastern Conference Finals with the Celtics a couple years ago. LeBron James isn't trusting a guy like Kyle Kuzma in the playoffs. The Lakers are done. What do you think a guy like Anthony Davis is thinking right now? The main reason he wanted out of New Orleans was because he wanted to win. Winning in the regular season doesn't matter. He wants to win titles. He wants to establish his legacy. He knows that he and a 35-year-old LeBron James are not going to be enough to get out of the Western Conference. Especially now that the Clippers are fucking loaded. Now the Miami Heat actually did the opposite of the Rockets and the Lakers. They actually improved at the trade deadline. Picked up Andre Iguodala in a trade with Memphis. First of all, I've seen where some Grizzlies players have been talking shit about Andre Iguodala. They're upset that he's held out for a trade all season, hasn't shown up for work in Memphis, hasn't played a game all year. And look, I get their frustration. I get it. But think about this from Andre Iguodala's perspective. He's 36 years old, three-time NBA champion, finals MVP in 2015, likely on the last contract of his career. He did not want to be traded from Golden State to Memphis. And he doesn't have any interest risking injury playing alongside a young team that is years away from making noise in the playoffs. So everyone got their wish. The young core in Memphis got rid of Iguodala and he got traded to a contender in the Eastern Conference. I still don't think they stand a chance against Milwaukee. But acquiring Iguodala does make Miami a lot better. He's a great wing player, will improve the defense in Miami, which they sorely need. The Heat are 14th in the league defensively, behind Milwaukee, Toronto, Boston, Philly, even the Pacers in the Eastern Conference. That's going to be a real problem come April, May, and June. The question is, is Andre Iguodala in game shape? Is he ready to go? And probably not. I know he said that he stayed in shape, but there's a difference between working out in the gym with your homies and playing 30 to 35 minutes in an NBA game. The big thing he'll bring, he's a high IQ basketball player. They can rely on him, especially late in games, to guard their opponent's best perimeter player, which is an upgrade over rookie Tyler Harrow. It also gives Jimmy Butler the luxury of not having to guard the opponent's best player, saving all the energy for the offensive end. I still don't think Miami has enough to make it out of the Eastern Conference this year. Milwaukee's going to be tough to beat in a seven-game series. They're not unbeatable, but they're going to be tough to beat. If Miami could have added Drew Holiday along with Iguodala, I would have liked their chances, at least a little bit more. Could you imagine the defense that tandem would be? Three of the best defenders in the league, Iguodala, Jimmy Butler, Drew Holiday. Both Butler and Holiday can score off the dribble as well. I think Pat Riley will pursue Drew Holiday this summer. It's going to be a weak free agent market. He knows they're still one piece away from contention. I just don't think David Griffin and Alvin Gentry were willing to let Holiday go right now. They're going to see how he looks the second half of the season with Zion Williamson and the young core in New Orleans. All right, that's all for today, guys. I'll be back tomorrow morning. Hit the like and subscribe button on YouTube. Make sure to click the notification bell to receive all notifications from the channel. Leave a five-star rating on iTunes. I appreciate all your support. Leave a comment in the section below. Let me know your thoughts. I will see you tomorrow.